Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. As Emily said, I'm Robin Surratt. I'm the Vice President for Lancaster History. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Tonight's lecture is actually part of Lancaster History's Regional History Colloqui Colloquium, which is now in its 24th year. And tonight we're delighted to welcome Connor Town O'Neill for our second virtual Regional History Colloquium. Uh, just like everyone else, we've adapted to these new circumstances and we're finding there really are some advantages to doing things differently. One such advantage being the ease with which we can welcome speakers from around the country who can come speak to us here in Lancaster. And likewise, we can speak to an audience that's joining us from around the nation. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I do want to remind you that on March 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll be joined by Dr. Bruce Levine, who will speak to us about his new book, Thaddeus Stevens, Civil War Revolutionary. If you have not already registered, I'll ask Emily to drop the link in the chat function um, where you can click on it and register there, or you can visit our website at lancasterhistory.org and click on events to get to our next few colloquia. I also want to thank the many of you who already support Lancaster History through contributions to our annual campaign um, and through participation in our membership program and invite anyone who isn't a member to consider supporting us uh, by joining our organization in either capacity. And again, you can find information on how to become a member or support Lancaster history, or just learn more about what's going on, uh, even while we're closed during the COVID-19 era um, by visiting our website at lancasterhistory.org. Now, uh, it's my true honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Connor Town O'Neill. Connor is the author of Down Along With That Devil's Bones, a Reckoning with Monuments, Memory, and the Legacy of White Supremacy. And if you have not yet read Connor's book, I can't recommend it strongly enough. Uh, it's thought-provoking, it's engaging, it's insightful, and it's remarkably relevant to the full national conversation we're all engaged with, especially as we wrestle with this question of what monuments say to us in this moment and how they can be managed community by community. Connor works as a producer on the NPR podcast, White Lies, which is also excellent. I can't recommend that highly enough. Um, and White Lies was a finalist for the 2020 Pulitzer Prize in audio reporting. Connor is originally from Lancaster, so we get to um, welcome you back home tonight, um, but currently lives in Auburn, Alabama, where he teaches at Auburn University and also teaches with the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Project. So Connor, thank you so much for being with us this evening and um, welcome back, albeit virtually. We're, we're delighted to have you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Robin and Emily and um, and everyone at, at Lancaster History. And, and, and thanks to you all uh, for being here. Um, it, is, it is really nice to be with you. Um, I, I would have left at the excuse to, uh, to come home and do this in person. Um, but it, it is good to be, it's good to be back in Lancaster, uh, if, if only virtually. Um, I, I talk with my hands a little bit and, and you might notice that an, a pen exploded on my hand today. So don't be distracted by the blue ink um, on this ink-stained wretch. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thanks again, y'all, for being here. Um, and and um, I hope we can uh, have a, a, a productive, interesting conversation um, after, I, after I talk a little bit and we open it up for uh, a QA. So I figure what I'll do is, um, talk about the book a little bit. I'll read from the book and maybe toggle back and forth a few times talking about it and reading from it. Um, and, and, and so I'll set up the book and then read a few passages that give you a sense of, of what I'm up to here. It, it's a book that's part journalism, part history, part personal reflection, sort of using those three different disciplines or, 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 or mediums to, you know, as a lens on the other ones. And um, anyway, it's sort of a hybrid book in that way. So so I'll talk about the book and what I'm up to, and I'll read from it, and, and I'll touch on stuff that I think echo a lot of recent events and, and, and controversies that, that, you know, Lancaster, like a lot of places are grappling with. Um, and of course, you know, where I am, <laughs> we're constantly grappling with this stuff. Um, and I hope that these passages will, will, will set the table for, for our conversation later in the hour. Um, so, so here goes. Um, you know, it's it's funny looking back now, um, and, and early March, uh, rapidly approaching. That really every day, of of almost the last six years, um, I've been chasing this story that I found in an old Southern cemetery. It's the story of Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, 
uh, although maybe more specifically, it's the story of his afterlife. Uh, it's the story of the fights over the fates of his many monuments, over the, you know, what the question of what the life of this slave trader, a Confederate military genius, a war criminal, a, and a, the, the first Grand Wizard of the Klan should mean to Americans today. Um, and it's a story that I stumbled onto really almost literally um, while I was looking for free parking. Uh, so this was back in March of 2015, the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama. That's the attack by Alabama officers on uh, peaceful uh, voting rights advocates, the late John Lewis among them at the front of the line. Um, and by that point in March of 2015, uh, even though I had grown up in Lancaster, I'd been living in Alabama for a couple of years at that point. I was uh, at the Graduate School for Creative Writing at the University of Alabama. And really have been trying to understand my new home by, and, and understand it, make sense of it, make sense of my place here in, in Alabama by studying the movement. Because at that point, 2013, 2014, 2015, there were all of these 50th anniversaries being commemorated from from the, the days of the, the civil rights movement, or at least the sort of classical era of the civil rights movement as, as it gets taught in schools. Uh, so the, the summer that I moved there is the 50th anniversary of uh, Governor Wallace's infamous stand in the schoolhouse door. Uh, that fall, the 50th anniversary of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham that claimed the lives of four little girls. Um, and around that time I had met Chip Brantley and Andy Grace and the three of us together had started researching and reporting uh, on a story about another looming 50th anniversary, uh, that of Bloody Sunday in Selma. So the story that I was working on uh, with Chip and Andy would go on to become uh, the White Lies podcast. Um, and, and I arrived that day in Selma uh, thinking a lot about the movement, thinking about its echoes in the present. Again, this was a moment, not just with those anniversaries happening, but this is, these are the early years of the movement for Black Lives. Uh, the Voting Rights Act that the you know, Bloody Sunday had you know, really instigated or, or at least provided the sort of political tailwind for um, that had just been gutted by a, a Supreme Court decision that had originated uh, in an Alabama county. Um, and, and so there were these there were these contemporary moments about voter suppression, about police violence um, and, and, and the black and, you know, being being called out by Black Lives Matter that that suggested a resonance of the history 50 years ago. But really, what I, what I realized as I showed up in Selma that day was that to really grapple with everything that was going on and understand the roots of it, I was going to have to jump back a whole, oh, another hundred years and back to uh, the Civil War era. And that's all because of the search for free parking. So Selma, small southern city, um, when President Obama shows up to deliver a speech, the, circus, the Secret Service with him, 40,000 other people uh, to, to hear him speech and to speak and to mark this anniversary. Um, parking was just a nightmare and I was a you know, broke graduate student. So, so I'm on the lookout for free parking wherever and it occurs to me, oh yes, Selma, one of these cities with the extensive cemeteries, think Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, you know, its own system of roads, the Spanish moss on the magnolias, the mausoleums, the whole, the whole thing sort of gone with the wind, uh, cliches. Um, and so I think, okay, I'll, I'll, it's near to downtown. I'll pull in uh, to the cemetery. I'll leave my car there and I'll walk down to the bridge and listen to Obama speak. Well, what I also learned was that in addition to having all of these other things in the cemetery, it also has a large Confederate section. And immediately on turning into this cemetery, I see these signs staked out. Confederate Memorial Circle closed for maintenance. Do not trespass and a couple of people with stern looks on their faces eyeing my car as I slowly approach in the gravel. And, you know, that's just catnip <laughs> for a reporter. So I, I just very credulously approach them and say, what are you doing here? Are you standing guard? This is the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. What are you neo-Confederates doing here, basically? Um, and, and come to learn that this group who called themselves the Friends of Forest had spent the better part of the last two decades fighting about this statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest that they had put up. And putting up a statue of the first Grand Wizard of the Klan is going to be controversial anyway. Doing it in Selma, given its prominence, its prominent place in civil rights lore, 
the city that gave the world a vote, as it's sometimes called, um, it, all the more so, all the more controversial. Uh, the fact that they did it in October of 2000, in the same week that the city's first, first black mayor was inaugurated, only compounded uh, the insult. And so this, this monument that had gone up on city property, no less, um, it was debated, it was protested, it's derided, it's defended, it's eventually moved out to the, to the cemetery, uh, then it's stolen. <laughs> But that only prompts more debate and eventually and, and protests and eventually a federal lawsuit. So by the time that I meet the Friends of Forest back in 2015 in that cemetery, they were fresh off a of victory in federal court. They were going to be able to replace uh, this statue and, and were out that day. Um, well, one of the reasons they were out that day, in addition to wanting to, I think, you know, bite their thumb at the uh, Bloody Sunday commemoration happening all around them, was to sort of prepare the grounds for this rededication. And the dissonance of that encounter, uh, meeting these neo-Confederates on this, this day of, of uh, meant to commemorate the, the violence and the sacrifice um, and the, the sort of moral clarity uh, of, of, of the movement, uh, it, it, it just raised all of these questions about who Forrest was, what it meant to put up a monument to him, what it meant to do so in 2015, what it meant to do it in Selma. Um, and, and a lot of those questions are, are questions that, that I'm, I'm grappling in, uh, within this book. Um, and and it, basically, sooner after that happened, I'm deep down the rabbit hole of Forrest, trying to figure out who he is, trying to figure out why there are all these monuments to him across the South, um, and, and, and starting to do some preliminary research. Um, and then two things happen uh, in, in the early summer of 2015 that, that both make me think, OK, this is, you know, I've really got a book on my hands here. It's not going to be some essay about collective memory and, and these weird monuments. Um, and those two things were one, the rededication of uh, this statue of Forrest in Selma. And then just three weeks after Forrest returns, at least symbolically returns to Selma, uh, Dylan Roof goes, uh, descends to the stairs to the basement of Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina and murders nine black parishioners at that church. Um, and, and in the days after, uh, Roof is arrested. I images from his blog start to circulate, and it becomes clear. It became clear in those days after that act of uh, American terrorism that he had gone on this strange sort of sightseeing tour around South Carolina, going to uh, former plantations, um, uh, cemeteries of enslaved people, sites of Civil War battlefields. Um, went to Sullivan's Island where some 40% of enslaved people who were brought to British North America first disembarked. Um, and almost sort of in a way to steal himself for what he was, what he was about to do in, in Charleston. And as soon as that's revealed about Roof, Confederate symbols, Confederate monuments become the sort of third rail of, of American politics. Bree Newsom scales the flagpole, the South Carolina Capitol to remove the Confederate flag that had flown there for some 50 years. Um, and, and, and I think that symbolic act really empowered people across the country to, to take up this referendum on Confederate symbolism and, and try, to, uh, try to get more of them removed. And so because of this strange encounter with Forrest and this obsession, and I, I don't think it's too strong a word, obsession that I was starting to um, lose myself in about him and his legacy. Um, I, I started to follow these debates about Confederate monuments aimed at Forrest specifically. And it, it, it turned out that Forrest was everywhere, really. There's a county in, in Mississippi named after him. There's a city in Arkansas named after him, a state park. In Tennessee, uh, in Tennessee, also there are more, there are more markers uh, of Nathan Bedford Forrest than there are to the three men who became president from that state combined. Um, so, so really, like as soon as I knew to look, Forrest was everywhere. Uh, and and so, what this book does is it it, it chooses four monuments in four different cities across the South. Um, and, and follows campaigns to try and remove those statues, but then also asking questions about sort of, you know, where did this, where did these statues come from? Who's defending them? Who's protesting them? Um, what, what are the aspects of forest life that intersect with this city? 
um, what's the history of the statue itself. So it, it blends past and present and, and, and personal and, and more political uh, issues. It, it's reported and, and, also, um, and also personal, but really in more than anything, it, it, it tells the story of, these, of, of the debates of these monuments. So it has these sort of four arcs uh, that chronicle the last five years of, you know, uh, upheaval, tumult, uh, sort of awakening uh, about race, at least among white Americans, to think about these questions um, more directly um, and, and, and less defensively, um, and, and, and to try and reckon with essentially the, the lasting injury of, of, of slavery. Uh, I think the big insight that I gleaned in, in, in really digging into the Civil War era was that that era of American life, I think, represented a really stark question, and one that I think we're still wrestling with, really, um, which is, can a settler slave society fully transform itself into a multiracial democracy? And I think that that's our question now. That was the question in, in the Civil War and the Reconstruction era. That was the question during the Civil Rights Movement. And that's, I think that really is the question now. And, and it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's made very literal. Um, the events of the, of the past month, I think, have made that, that all too clear uh, from, from Stop the Steal to um, indelible images like this one in the Capitol from, from January 6th. And I think, you know, there's, there's a version of this book that might have just been a more sort of third person um, piece of, of, of reporting following these, these debates about Confederate monuments that were breaking out in 2015, taking on increasing urgency after the Unite the Right rally in 2017, um, and, and following the fates of these monuments. They're up. They're protested, do they come down? Um, and, and, and doing a reporting that would answer those questions and, and, and you know, setting those debates in the, the relevant historical context. Um, but what happened was, as I was doing that work, as I was doing that research and reporting, was that I, I started to track a more sort of internal transformation that, that was happening. Um, because really, when you start to dig into the legacy of slavery and, and under that, the lie of white supremacy that Americans have, were telling to justify that system, um, starting to see how cataclysmic that system was, the, 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 the physical and spiritual torture uh, inflicted on, on, on millions of, of enslaved people, um, generations of enslaved people. Um, and, and, but then also seeing how catalytic it was for the American economy, how, what a vested interest so many white Americans had in not just the financial spoils of that system, but the, the, the psychological superiority that it offered uh, white Americans. And then seeing how so many of those systems to protect that hoarded wealth, to protect that stolen land um, and, and, and the resources extracted from them, uh, that project endured long after emancipation from who's eligible for the Social Security Act, the GI Bill, redlining, predatory loans, how schools are funded, how district lines are drawn, all of these ways, um, not just illuminated the, the lasting injury of slavery and how it continues to shape our present, but then showing me that actually I, I had a stake in this, that it could have been convenient to think, oh, you know, I'm a northerner, I grew up in the same place as Thaddeus Stevens. You know, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm good on this. Um, but, but really coming to see how, given the, the persistence of this country's racial hierarchy, of course, even if I was just passively participating in it, these notions, these really kind of psychotic notions of, of race in America were shaping my life too, and, 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 and to my benefit. Um, so, I, so much about this material, I think, insisted that I, I ask deeper questions, not just whether that statue was wrong or whether it will come down and where it came from, but, but how far out, how far is its reach, right? And, and what are the systems that these symbols are representing? And how do they reflect back onto me? How have they shaped my life too? Um, and so I maybe that sets up uh, a, a little bit of uh, uh, context for 
the first piece that I want to read, which comes toward the end of the, the, the prologue in this book, and, and given the, the hometown crowd here, I thought this would be relevant. Um, so here goes. When I first started writing about Forrest, I conceived of myself as an outside observer. I would bear witness, document, report on the referendums on Forrest taking place in these four cities. But I came to see a larger proxy war in the offing, one that has engulfed the entire nation and implicated me as well. As I logged thousands of miles in my dusty old sedan, conducted scores of interviews, buried into, burrowed into archives and trudged across battlefields, cemeteries, interstate roadsides and college campuses, to stand before these monuments, I was prompted to ask questions about race that I'd never asked before, had never thought to ask before. So much about American life encourages white people to take our whiteness for granted. It's the stock photo, the room tone of American life meant to be conflated with the norm. It's insidious that way. Growing up, whiteness often went without saying, but that's precisely it. It goes without saying because we don't wanna talk about whiteness, don't wanna see it, we want to think about what it means, where it came from, or why we still seem to need it. This assumption gets expressed when people wonder aloud why we don't have a white history month or insist that all lives matter. But as I charted the battles over forest monuments, I would come to see how whiteness operated, its prerogatives and its amnesia, its symptoms and its sickness. There were no Confederate monuments where I grew up in central Pennsylvania. Instead, there were a series of charred stone pylons that stretched across the nearby Susquehanna River just west of my childhood home. In the summer of 1863, in order to prevent Robert E. Lee from moving on Harrisburg and Philadelphia, town leaders decided to burn a portion of the bridge. The whole thing went up in flames. Stymied, Lee regrouped the Southwest. That's why the Battle of Gettysburg happened in, well, Gettysburg. The pylons of that bridge still stand in the water. I used to kayak past them all the time. But even though Lancaster, Lancaster County's riverbank doubled as the Confederacy's high water mark, and its southern border was the Mason-Dixon line, I didn't think that history had anything to do with me. I figured I floated above it like a kayak on the river. I felt this way despite how common it was to see Confederate flags affixed to the cab's pickup trucks, or the fact that my ninth grade history student teacher began the Civil War unit telling us that the war was fought over states' rights. Or even what political strategist James Carville famously said about how everything between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia might as well be Alabama. I never thought about being implicated in any of that history because, well, this was Pennsylvania. Growing up in the North had fostered in me a sense that I was somehow exempt from the legacy of the Civil War. There were, of course, more pointed moments that should have jarred me from this sense. One in particular stands out. Before we moved to Lancaster, my family lived in Philadelphia. As the only white boy in my kindergarten class, I would cast as the arresting officer in the annual Rosa Parks play. And so I pinned on the badge of Officer Day, Montgomery PD, stepped onto the Houston Elementary School stage and removed Miss Parks from the bus. In a, in a similar position the year before, my brother did the same. By asking me to step into that role, my teacher, Mrs. Goodman, had provided me with an opportunity to see that being white meant something, that it carried a legacy, one forged by violence and injustice, but cast as benevolent and benign. For years though, that lesson was lost on me. I would have to learn the hard way what James Baldwin meant when he wrote that, quote, people who imagine that history flatters them are impaled on their history like a butterfly on a pin and become incapable of seeing or changing ourselves or the world. The memory of that Rosa Parks play revisited me in the morning that I met the Friends of Forest. Pat Godwin had grinned when I told her that I was from Lancaster. They were raising money for their new forest statue by selling miniatures of the bust, she told me, miniatures that had been cast in York. A few minutes later, Todd Kiskaden told me, would ask me if I believed in the 10th Amendment to the Constitution. I nodded, unable to recall what it meant exactly, but went along with it because it was the Constitution. Suddenly, he had me in a tight handshake and congratulated on me on being a proud Confederate soldier who believed in states' rights. I recoiled, but he only held tighter. No, sir, not me, I wanted to say. I'm from Pennsylvania. But his point was clear. Whether I liked it or not, they were putting this forest monument up in my name too. I was implicated, pinned to forest like a sheriff's badge. To tell his story, I would have to revise the story I told about myself. And so I think in a lot of ways that experience in Selma and the, the story of that 
Forest Monument in Selma really acted as a kind of, uh, uh, in a very prescient way, sort of foretold um, what was going to happen in, in the country at large in the years after. So, so that was a, a, a fight from about 2000 to 2015 and, and was resolved, or insofar as it's resolved, um, was resolved the year that suddenly these fights break out everywhere else. And so Selma really sets the stage for the other, um, the other cities that I visit and report on. Uh, one of the stories has to do with a, a building on the campus of Middle Tennessee State University, which is in Murfreesboro. Um, they, in the, the 1950s, after the uh, Brown v. Board decision, but before the school had been integrated, followed that decision, um, uh, they named their ROTC building Forest Hall. In the aftermath of, of the Charleston Nine murders, uh, students on campus mounted a protest to uh, try and get the school to change the name. And in response, the, the university created a task force, which if you've ever been on a task force, or at least task forces the universities uh, conceive of, you know that that's the, you're sort of slow walking something. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, and, and so the, the task force decided to stretch this decision, this debate about Forest on over an entire academic year. They held these forums where they invited students, faculty, staff, members of the community uh, to, to weigh in on, on this question about whether they should change the name of Forest Hall and held them in the sort of tit for tat fashion where you'd have a speaker who was pro forest, you'd have a, a speaker who, is, who uh, wanted to hold the university accountable to you know, all the wrongs that Forrest was, was guilty of and, and just sort of went back and forth like that and, and started to function as a kind of microcosm for the broader uh, uh, polarized political atmosphere that was happening around that time, late 2015 into 2016, um, and, and really has, has sustained uh, political, it's kept on in political discourse ever since. Um, it, but there was, um, uh, the, the, the student protesters developed a really canny way of engaging with uh, what they saw as a kind of bad faith debate that um, they were drawing a false equivalence between, say, Forrest's military acumen uh, and his role as the first Grand Wizard in the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and, and, and they felt like racism shouldn't have been, shouldn't even, shouldn't be debated at this point. So they attended these, these forums, but they also protested them and disrupted them in this very canny, um, you know, political theater and, and, and protest. Um, and and as, as one of the student protesters told me, it felt to them like they were working harder to improve the university than the university was to improve them. Um, but they, their campaign was very nearly effective. And part of this has to do with the, the arcane and esoteric laws that protect monuments in states like Tennessee and Alabama. Um, so the task force decided, okay, yes, we should change the name. So that got kicked up to the president of the university who also said, yes, we should change the name. That decision got kicked up to the state board of regents who also said, yes, we should change the name. Um, but then there was one last hurdle, the state's historical commission uh, who denied their, their request. Uh, and so Forest Hall to this day remains Forest Hall. I also write about this cartoonish, grotesque travesty of a statue that's sculpted out of uh, bath fixtures. It sits just off the roadside of uh, I-65 in, in, coming into South Nashville. Um, and it, it's really easy to crack jokes about. It's by far the ugliest Confederate statue, which I would guess puts it in the running for ugliest statue writ large. Uh, but the story of the sculptor I found revealed a much darker undercurrent of American life that has sped into the mainstream uh, in, in recent years. So this is sculpted by a man named Jack Kershaw, uh, who led the statewide resistance to school integration in Tennessee in the 1950s. In the 1970s, he represented James Earl Ray, the man accused of assassinating Martin Luther King. Uh, and in the 1990s, in addition to uh, his, his sculpting, uh, he co-founded a group known as the League of the South. It's a neo-Confederate group, uh, an explicitly now and explicitly white nationalist group, uh, secession, bent on secession uh, earnestly. <laughs> um, and it, Kershaw died in, in, in 2010, but the the, the group has, has lived on and become increasingly radical since Kershaw's death and were responsible for instigating a lot of violence in Charlottesville in 2017. So 
In addition to visiting the statue and telling the story of its sculptor, I also try to show the deeper trails of, of white supremacist movements that gathered force long before Donald Trump announced his candidacy for president or before his followers uh, staged an insurrection in the US Capitol. Um, so that's, in, that's in, in Nashville. And then the last, the fourth city that I visit um, is, is Memphis, um, which is, is central to forest life and in which at least until late 2017, uh, for over 100 years stood this 30 foot bronze equestrian statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest. It's dedicated in 1905, commissioned this famous uh, Parisian sculptor to do it. They dug up records from his tailor to, to make the proportions exactly right. Um, they even went so far as to exhume Forrest's body and his wife's body so that they could rebury them in the base of this statue. He had died in 1877. Um, and so, it, you know, a quarter century had gone by and they went out to the cemetery and dug him up again. Um, anyway, this statue, like Forest Hall at, MT, at Middle Tennessee State University, is protected by this um, Heritage Protection Act in Tennessee. Um, and so, twice the city of Memphis went before the Historical Commission asking for permission to remove this statue and twice were denied. Um, so they found a loophole in the law. This, the Heritage Protection Act uh, kept, pertained to statues and, and memorials and you know, things of, of public history on public land, uh, but didn't say anything about private property. So the city sold the park that this statue was in to a county commissioner. And as soon as the ink was dry on the bill of sale, that statue came down uh, in a really dramatic late night removal, um, a really powerful moment with the, the, the crane lifting the, the statue from the base and sort of hung there in the air for a few minutes, slowly swaying back and forth. And some of the, the sources that I talked to are responsible for protests and leading the protests against the statue and, and, and getting it down, really talked about how moving that moment was when, when the, the slack caught on, on, on the straps and, and the statue was actually removed. Um, but the, the removal too, it, it also prompted more truth telling about Forrest in Memphis. And, and around the time of, of, of the removal, a member of a church, uh, of an Episcopal church in downtown Memphis, discovered something pretty discomforting, that the, the parking lot of that church was once the site of Forrest's slave mart in the city. And the, the, while the church was there, so they, they were next door to Forest Slave Mart. Um, and so he and his church, Calvary Episcopal, organized this service to acknowledge that truth about, about their location and to honor the men, men and women um, who passed through what is now their parking lot. Um, and, and so I think that this, this ceremony that they staged is, is really sort of functions as the climax of the book. So I apologize if there's a, a sort of spoiler here, but, but I think it, it synthesizes a lot of the questions in this book and, and um, I think will be good to, to dig into. So, so I'll, I'll just read a few more pages and then, and then we can chat. Um, okay, so the service is called the Service of Remembrance and Reconciliation and it takes place on April 4th uh, 2018, so 50 years to the day um, from the assassination of Martin Luther King, really just you know, a mile down the road at, at the Lorraine Motel. Um, and let's see, okay, so 100, 600 people filled the pews of, of Calvary Episcopal, crowded in behind the last roll and spilled out into the lobby. I'm glad that this fuller truth will be told for many decades to passersby said the Reverend Scott Waters, the rector at Cavalry. The uncomfortable tension this story exposes may be more poignantly ours as the people of Calvary Church than anyone else's, and it can change us if we let it. The racial caste system of the antebellum South, he noted, was a part of the ordinariness of life for most white Memphians at the time, as it was for those parishioners of the church, just the water in which they swam. Illusions are invisible to it. most of us who hold them. That's what makes them illusions, Waters said. But he cautioned that our temptation today may be to make monsters out of our Christian forebears and imagine that maybe we could never be so blind to such horrors. This is a dangerous illusion as well. Reverend Walters then told the crowd that a series of people would come to the pulpit to read the names of 78 men, women, and children 
the names of some who had been bought and sold at Taurus Slave Mart. It was a way he explained to honor them, to provide in a small and simple way a dignity once denied them. But it was also a way to offer a confession, a way for those gathered to drop the illusion of innocence and to restore a proper tension in our lives as we wonder together what in Memphis and what in America should be unsettling our prayers today. Dr. Charles McKinney, chair of the Africana Studies at Department at Rhodes College, rose to the pulpit. Names of the enslaved sold at 87 Adams, 1854 to 1862, he said as the church bell began a steady toll, marking time and tribute. Into its ring, he read, Jerry, age 35, Charles, age 45, Dick, age 14, Paige, age nine. From the second lectern across the sanctuary, another began reading. She recited the next name, Tom, age 16. A small but remarkable thing happened. Someone stood up. A balding man in chinos and sport coat rose, his hands clasped in front of him, his head down. The whole gravity of the room, already trembling, shifted in that moment. Our history and all its weight was embodied, remembered in the sanctuary. By the time Bond read the name Solomon, age 20, people throughout the church were standing. And when her voice broke briefly between the 20 and one of a man named Ishmael, everyone in the church was on their feet. People choked back sobs, the bell tolled. She read on, Harrison, age 16, Wilson, age eight. The service was an American elegy set to the toll of the church bell. It created a space for honesty about America's past and our present where those in the church could see and feel what whiteness had wrought in a more urgent human way. It was not a kumbaya moment, but something both smaller and more honest, a simple gesture, profoundly urgent and profoundly basic, redolent of dignity and grief and shame and love and horror and confession and good and evil and the devil and God. In other words, it was wholly American and thus befitting a ceremony meant to restore the tension of the country's original sin. It was a start. It suggested a way to re-understand American history, grounded in the acknowledgement of the names and ages and lives lived and robbed in this space. The campaign to tell the truth about Forrest also revealed a truth about ourselves, who we've been, who we are, who we might yet be. Connor, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for concluding on that reading. And I know you say it's a spoiler alert, but um, I, it, there's nothing um, about what you could read from your book tonight that would be a spoiler. Everyone should go out and read this book um, just to catch all the nuanced details of the four communities that you uh, really address. And I love that you said, I wrote this down, that, um, that this really caused you to revise the story you tell about yourself. Um, and I, I have to say, your, your book did the same for me, um, reading about your experiences. I grew up in North Carolina with family in Tennessee, in Nashville, um, and reading through the way that you kind of dive into all these issues, um, it really caused for me this sort of awakening of wanting to know more about who my distant family was, not just my, my known family, and the role that may have been, uh, they may have played in um, issues of enslavement of racism in the South. So, um, and I don't think this is just something isolated to those of us who grew up in the South. I think this is a story that can really resonate with folks from uh, across the country, especially in the East. Um, and so actually I'm gonna start my Q&A with a combination of a question I have, but also Tommy Athey um, put one in the Q&A and I'm gonna combine them into one. Okay, um, and, you know, so your work deals specifically with these four communities in the South and um, I love that you, you read the part where you mentioned that there are no Confederate monuments in Lancaster. Actually, if you were here tonight live and in person, I would take you down to the archive and show you the standing order we have in our collection for uh, the citizens of Columbia to burn that bridge between oh. Columbia and Wrightsville. So if the moment came where we needed to uh, keep the Confederacy at bay, they could do what they needed to do, and they did. Um, but that is, in a sense, that's really one of our, our few sort of um, physical memorials to uh, the Civil War here in Lancaster. So even though the war wasn't fought here, thanks to folks who burnt that bridge, um, uh, do you find that these same issues of memory and history are as relevant to a community like ours as they are to a place like Selma? And um, as Tommy phrased it really nicely, um, you describe a sense of guilt of the South and a false innocence of the North. Mm. 
Um, so we'd love it if you could elaborate on really what that might mean for those of us in Lancaster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think there, you know, um, Robert Penn Warren has this great framework for, uh, for thinking about the legacy of the Civil War and, and he calls it um, the treasury of virtue. The, the, the northerner sense that because of our affiliation with um, with the Union Army that and, and because the major consequence of the war is the emancipation of the enslaved that uh, we sort of uh, are, are absolved from that that the Civil War sort of becomes a, an event horizon we're on the right side of that so we're all good anything <laughs> like there's 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 nothing that that history can ask of us anymore based on that affiliation. Um, which, which of course is, is not true, right? I mean, I think um, it's, about, it's about guilt and innocence, but I think it's also about, I think those are the, those are, those are the sort of first set, of, that's like your first emotional response to digging into to some of this history. I think at least as it was for me, what that shifted to was a, a better understanding of like the world, the world that I live in, the world that I grew up in, um, the places that I grew up in, like Lancaster, um, not like Lancaster, but the place I grew up, Lancaster, <laughs> was was a thing made and, and was shaped by that history. And I think that that's, um, that was one of the insights of, of working on a book that's part reporting and part history was that that always suggests, uh, you have to account for the gap, right? You, 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 you've got some from column A, the present, some from column B, the past. And, and, and when you're doing that, you're constantly trying to figure out like, okay, how is the past shaping the present? What, what from this history that I'm looking at is, 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 is coming to uh, impact me in, in, in this moment? And I, and, and I think part of that is that we just, or at least I, I'll just speak for myself, I had taken so much for granted. I didn't think about the world that I grew up in as a thing made or as a thing shaped, but just the way it was. And so you look at something like the, the inequities that we have in this country, a country that has a 10 to one racial wealth gap. A lot of people try and look at that and talk about personal responsibility or laziness or, or issues about the individual but, but if you're if you're looking at the history and, and you're and you're looking at the lines on which American wealth is built on American opportunities on access to resources and land it has everything to do with race the very idea of race is a, is a really is about inequity there's nothing about the meaning of whiteness there's nothing about what whiteness is intended to do that can be separated from inequity. It is about a hierarchy, what it means to be white as Americans have conceived of it over the past couple centuries is entitlement, is opportunity, is, is, is both material wealth, but also this sense of, of psychological superiority. Um, but again, you know, you don't notice the water that you're swimming in until you have these moments that sort of um, jar you into into that that consciousness and and that's what this story was for me I was taking so much for granted about um, about Amer American political life and my place in it um, and it wasn't until I dug into this into this story that I had to really grapple with it and partly because sources wouldn't talk to me until I showed them that I could do it um, like Mayor Perkins and Selma I had chased him around for a long time trying to get convince him to do an interview and what I realized after he finally agreed to it was that he was feeling me out. He sort of, that, that statue going up as soon as he's elected is such a spectacle. And so many, and, and other people had written about it. And I think because, because of that spectacle. And, and I think he wanted to see if I was grappling with this story in a way that understood that I had a place in it too, that he wasn't gonna tell me what it meant for this statue of Forrest to go up when he's elected, what it meant to him until I could talk about what it meant to me, which is, that I had a sense of the consequences of this story, the meaning of this. Um, and it, until I could do that, he, you know, my calls went to voicemail. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I think, I think part of it is, is getting over a, a sense of American exceptionalism, basically. Like the received wisdom is all about how this country is so great um, and, and, and subtly unimpeachable, right? The history has no claim on us because we're the best nation in the world and we're founded on these unimpeachable 
ideals on a, you know, unalienable rights. Um, while at the same time, all of these contradictions of, of settlement and, and enslavement and, and the racial hierarchy that's justifying that enslavement are, are, are totally undermining that project. And yet we can't ask questions about it be, for that very reason, it, because it does undermine the project. You see this in like the, the, the response to the Times, the 1619 project, right? The 1776 commission. Um, it, no, understanding that, that to say that history has a claim on us, asking us to be respons responsible for our history, um, really raises a lot of questions about how we address this inequity in our present. So anyway, that's a long and rambling answer, but well, I think- it, it, But it, it actually begs the next question. I mean, so finally you had the mayor um, answering your calls and your books come out and it's been well received and you're getting um, to go virtually at least around the country on book talks. Have you found a willingness among your audience to think about this? Are, are you finding as you go, you know, location to location, that people are willing to really look closely at the unflattering side of history and um, dive into issues of memory. Yeah, I mean that that's really been an amazing part of it. Um, when I was working on the the White Lies podcast, uh, Andy and Chip and I would talk about what we called uh, the father-in-law question, which was, can you take this? sweeping, indicting story, whether that's of, uh, you know, a covered up murder in the civil rights era, whether that's the, you know, <laughs> all of this, these honorifics to the, the first leader of the Klan. Um, can you, can you be responsible to that story? Can you, can you be true to the, the horrors really of that story and the indictments that, that are lurking under that story. But can you do it in a way where you make the questions feel urgent and alive and 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 in the story work well enough that that someone who might be skeptical of those ideas is is willing to keep going and, and to follow you down those rabbit holes and into those those deeper, darker corners of the story. Um, and and so to get to get emails from um, you know from from older folks especially has been um, has been really uh, gratifying and an indication that you know with the um, that at least it's it's passing <laughs> it's passing that that, that father-in-law test and I think beyond that um, I think it, it 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 shows us where we are that that as as harrowing as things seem, and, and though it feels as though we're sort of in an 11th hour kind of moment, I really do think more and more, more and more people, more and more white Americans specifically are coming into a consciousness about this stuff and willing to, to, to see those ideas of American exceptionalism and instead sort of grapple with um, the, the claims that our history makes on us. So that's really encouraging. Susan Baldridge, um, who you know, and who is also um, has a background as a journalist, is asking um, in your reporting experiences, are you finding that fear is really the overriding emotion among those who don't want to discuss or allow equality? Yeah, I think fear is, is a huge part of it. And, and it's fear, um, there's the, the, the sense of a fear of replacement, right? This is the, the Jews will not replace us line at, at, at the Unite the Right rally. I think it's also, it's, it's a fear in, induced by scarcity. Right, it, going back and looking at at the the rise of this concept of race in America and, and the beginnings to to name the pale skinned Europeans uh, who who had come to America as white really has to do with uh, reveals the way that 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 race and class are so intertwined in this country and, and how they and, and how that's driven by a sense of scarcity. Um, there, you've got a few wealthy. Um, folks, you know, sort of governors of the colony of Virginia, for example, and then a bunch of indentured, uh, European indentured servants and enslaved for life Africans who greatly outnumber the planter class. Um, and, and after Bacon's rebellion, where there was this sort of, in part, a cross-racial uprising uh, against the, the elites, um, those planters realize that they have a problem on their hands. And the way that they, one of the ways that they solve it is to give a sense of racial entitlement and superiority to uh, the indentured servants. And so there's still, um, 
there's still that system of scarcity. They don't have a lot, but they have at least this sense of, of, of psychological superiority to, to the enslaved Africans. And so you have in that, that trade-off from a, a better class position for a, a sense of that, that racial entitlement, um, sort of bottom rung avoidance as it's called, um, is, is just so reliably invoked over the course of American history that I think that that, that, that fear of, of inferiority and in this in, 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 in the context of, of scarcity, where there's not everyone has equal access to, to, to resources, to land, to a good job, to you know, it, 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 the, the trappings of a more equitable society. Like if there is going to be this class stratification that, that race is going to be used to, to enforce that or, or maintain that. Um, and I think that that's the, and, and that fear of losing your place of potentially falling, falling further um, is, is at the heart of a lot of this. Yeah, it is that fear. Um, so I'm going to combine two other questions into one as best I can, both about education. Um, you know, from your vantage point as a northerner who's teaching in the Deep South, um, do you have a, what's your sense of what your students um, perceive about the movement to remove Confederate statues? Um, and rename schools and parks and buildings. Um, and I'll, then I'll give you the follow-up part of it. Um, sorry, could, would, you, would you mind repeating Can I that? give you the first part of that again? Yeah, yeah once you're, you just given your vantage point coming from the North and teaching Southern students, um, mm. what, what do you get in terms of the sense from your students, their willingness to at least have this debate or how do they feel about the movement to, to remove statues and rename buildings? Hmm. I think, I think more, more young people are willing to, to seed the, the symbol. Okay, maybe the, the symbol is, is wrong, but it, it harder to get them to see um, the, the deeper wrong that those, that those symbols embody. Um, and, and that's, and that's really, that's really the trick. I mean, I, um, I, done, I did an event uh, a little while back with Todd Mealy, who teaches at uh, Penn Manor High School, teaches history at Penn Manor High School, and he's doing a lot of excellent work on how to introduce um, concepts of race and, and, and the, the sort of social function of race in America um, to high school students, which I think is just uh, an uh, amazing and, and Herculean task in some ways. Um, because, it, and, and as we were sort of comparing notes on, on that, um, on that ask, part of what you're doing is you're, you're sort of having to disarm or, or work through that defensiveness and that, that sense of entitlement to a happy history that, that I think so many Americans continue to get as the kind of you know, received wisdom of this being the greatest country in the world. What's useful though, is that even if, our, even if we have this really faulty collective memory, the documents have no ambiguity, you know? If you go look at the documents of secession of a state like Mississippi, or you go look at the speeches by Confederate President Jefferson Davis or Vice President Alexander H. Stevens, they're telling anyone who would listen what this project was about. Primary it, sources. <laughs> right, exactly. That it was not just to perpetuate and expand slavery into the West, but specifically, on this notion of, 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 of white supremacy and black inferiority. And, and that just makes it really clear. I mean, this is always the, this is always the great tool of teaching history is that you, when you're working with the documents, you, you, can, you can be a little bit more direct about it. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I, it's, but it's tough, right? I mean, it really is, we, we don't, we don't want to talk about whiteness because it, it, it's so, it is so fraught and it's so indicting. I mean, it is, it, it has been a way of um, claiming things that we had no moral right to claim so that we could hoard those things for ourselves and for our, you know, for posterity. Um, and so to talk about it is to bring forward you know, a massive ledger to be reckoned. And so I think even if it's just sort of some consciously, like we, we can't talk about this stuff because it will, it, it sort of will all unravel. So much of, of our society is predicated on this idea and of not talking about this idea, making it seem natural that we have uh, the society that we have and, and that the inequalities of that system are, you know, individual problems and not, not structural. Yeah, 
So much of what we do or attempt to do at Lancaster History is really um, instruct students at a young age the, the relevance and primacy of primary sources. But it's one thing to even read in the textbook the story of how something's unfolded, but unless you're getting at the original core document, uh, an eyewitness testimony, you really miss that opportunity to understand the precision of why something happened, um, mm -hmm. how it unfolded. Um, yeah, and one of the other questions was about, um, you know, do you, what are your thoughts on the opportunity to, to really create this change almost in a pipeline fashion by starting with K-12 education? Um, and maybe that's something that you and Todd Mealy uh, had a conversation about. Uh, you know, any thoughts on, is it really about uh, getting to our youth and, and sharing the story? I think that's, that's, that has to be part of it. Um, I, I think the other thing that has to be a part of it is to, if you can, if you can sort of correct the record, if you can, if you can make an, a, a solid intervention into American collective memory, into get, get us to a common understanding of a different version of our past, one that, that, that points to this lasting injury of, of white supremacy and of slavery and of all the forms of uh, racial exploitation that persisted long after emancipation. If you can, if, if you can be more clear-eyed about that past, you're much closer to having a consensus, maybe not much closer, because who knows when we'll get to a consensus on these questions, but you're closer at least to having a consensus about progressive interventions that need to happen in the present, right? Things like student debt and where and and, and how that's perpetuated and how Black Americans and specifically Black women bear so much more uh, student debt. The way that the way that public schools are zoned and funded, um, the way housing works, and, and <laughs> really property more generally. I mean, it 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 creeps into all of these um, all of these facets of, of 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 American life. And 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 I think if you have a better sense of the really the, the more terrifying aspects of America's past and, and the way that, that that race was used to to further those injustices, you have a better sense of what the remedy is in the present. So so yeah, reaching, I think reaching reaching young people is is crucial for doing that. Um, but I mean I, I think we can't wait. Like these are these are urgent um, these are urgent, pressing questions with with lives on the line. So I think it's, you know, it's it's about it's about reaching everyone. Mm -hmm. So Fergus Bordewick sent a question in um, that that has a, a good museum tie. Um, he's saying at Fort Pillow um, in Tennessee, Nathan Bedford Forrest presided over a, a massacre of Black um, Union troops and some White Union troops, and it's a terrible war crime. And that site really is not um, well known. Or it's not well interpreted. Um, and his question is, you know, given a site like that and the opportunity inherent in it, um, are you, did you experience um, other similar places that really can be interpreted and, and become counter monuments to um, challenging the South's memorializing of the Confederacy? Yeah, I mean, it's really bracing to go to Fort Pillow, which is a state park. I mean, it's a, it's a state historical park. Um, and, and it does have you know, a, a, a museum, but the museum sort of soft pedals what happens. Um, talks about a lot of other really uninteresting <laughs> history of that fort too, which has nothing to do with this massive, really important racial massacre that happens sort of the end of the war. Um, and, and then, you know, just like camping and, and fishing. And there are all these, I, I walked out to where the, the, the lasting sort of battlements are where the massacre happened on the banks of the river. And they're like inspirational signs for, exercising like who goes there to exercise like clearly someone does um but but yeah i mean i think again just like looking to a history that doesn't have to flatter us but that instead could can seek to hold us accountable to to the darker parts of our past i think if we don't feel so entitled to that to that to that happy history um will at least be a little closer to, to addressing the, um, this, the issues that, that led to something like the Fort, like the Fort Phillip massacre taking place. Um, but again, like I think that we are in this moment where there's a lot of thinking about how to counter that. Um, 
and 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 how to be tell a fuller story, tell a more honest story. Uh, the the book ends in in Montgomery with the uh, memorial for peace and justice, more colloquially known as the uh, lynching memorial that commemorates. It has these uh, steel columns that represent each county that a, a, a lynching took place in from the end of Reconstruction to 1950. So there are 800 of them and some 4,400 um, known people who, who, were, who were lynched in that era. Um, and, and, and that, you know, that memorial has no has has no quibbles about wanting to um, console you or to inspire you, but that but it just instead to tell to tell this truth about about the horrors of of racism of, of racism in this country and the violence that is used to enforce that that racial hierarchy. Um, so I think places like that are really moving. Um, I think things that are going on with people are paying, starting to pay more attention to the, the land that they're on, doing land acknowledgements. I mean, just these, these sort of daily, bringing that history into your daily life and knowing that nothing about how we live um, was, was predestined and, or, or inherently good, <laughs> um, but that instead was, was shaped by forces of this racial hierarchy, of the, the, the sort of consumptive needs of, 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 a, of a capitalist economy. Um, and that, that, that we can trace, that the, the more we can trace that past into our present, I think um, the better chance we have of, of making the society more equitable. We, um, we're, we're all for finding ways to connect our past with our present. Um, I will, in a minute, let you get back to your um, infant daughter and your evening in Alabama. Um, but I just want to close on a question that is uh, a good way to wrap up a Lancaster um, in the discussion and, and Marissa asks how being from Lancaster may have shaped other people's perceptions of you and your journey as you've explored this topic. Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think it was it made a lot of people skeptical of me. <laughs> um, but I think that skepticism was important. I mean, one, because it prompted a lot of self-reflection on my part and made me want to dig into to my stake in this story. But also I think anytime you're, you have to sell uh, a potential source on, on why you want to talk to them, the, the better your conversation will be because it's really clear why you want to talk to them. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think it was uh, a lot of the neo-Confederate types didn't want to talk to me because I wasn't a Southerner and it was, um, clear that I wasn't a Southerner. I actually got a new phone. I got a new number so that I would I could place calls <laughs> with an Alabama area code um, that when that 717 number pops up, uh, people were skeptical. Of it. And it was, it was instantaneously, more people started returning my calls when I was calling to them with an Alabama number. Um, so there was, a, there was a little bit of, of that skepticism, but, it, but I, I think there was, there was a real benefit to being, to not having grown up in the South and to, to be able to see, um, you know, with, with fresh eyes a little bit like, whoa, this guy Forrest is everywhere. That is weird. What's the deal with it? Just those really basic early questions that I was asking might not have occurred to me. I, I talked to Madison Smart Bell, who's a great novelist, uh, has a, a, a novel about Forrest called Devil's Dream. And I called him at one point just to, he, he knew Jack Kershaw, who's the sculptor of that statue in Nashville. Um, and so I called him up just to talk about Forrest and, and about Kershaw. And he was saying, you know, when I grew up in Nashville, Forrest was just the water that I swam in. Um, you just took it for granted that he was everywhere. And so there was that sort of, you know, stranger comes to town kind of story uh, for me that, that, that was beneficial in that way, just to, to, to not take any of it for granted and see it clearly. It makes us, um, it should probably make all of us wonder what, are, what water are we swimming in and what are we not seeing even in a place like Lancaster where we can look around and see a different legacy, but also there's a lot that we miss in our conversation. I think um, one of the, the key um, hopes I have for uh, Lancaster is that we can be open and transparent and honest as we really dig into these issues and, and move forward with our own reckoning. Um, about monuments and memory and um, our history and our legacy. Um, and you have kicked us off on a great start uh, for those of us who were able to be with you tonight. So I just want to say thank you again 
Um, it's really a pleasure to hear from you. Again, for folks who have not yet read Connor's book, I can't recommend it highly enough. Got my copy here. Um, and uh, folks, thank you all so much for being here tonight. We look forward to participating with you in our next colloquium in March. Um, Connor, come back to Lancaster. I'll show you the, um, the standing order to burn the bridge and anything else you want to see in our collection. And uh, we look forward to meeting you in person. Amazing, can't wait. Yeah, but thank you again. And thanks everyone. We look forward to seeing you in March. Um, Connor, have a great evening down in Alabama. Thanks y'all. Thanks everyone for coming. I really enjoyed this. Thank you.